Can a river be a mother? Can humanity in birth, in rites of passage and in death find solace in the arms of a river? Yes, it can if the river happens to be Ganga. My name is Loke Shori and I am a cultural anthropologist. For over 10 years, I have been researching the various aspects that make Ganga so special for mankind. Come with me as we, through the series supported by ATCS, take a peek into little known aspects of the Mother River in her journey through the Himalayas. India is an ancient land credited with a long and unbroken history of civilization. Here, natural endowments like the Himalayas and the river Ganga were always considered sacred. I have always wondered whether it was this reverence for nature that translated into an appreciation for the human figure rarely attained anywhere else in materials such as sandstone so early in history. This infusion of poetry into stone cannot just be explained away as craft. The manner in which the people who made these figures reached under the skin of the characters they were depicting points towards a detailed study of the human condition, anatomy, philosophy, and a strong connect with the spiritual. Centers of art like Mathura, as most historians claim, rose to greatness in sandstone sculpture because they were located close to pink sandstone quarries. As Mathura grew into prominence, the arts and culture evolving here also brought into their ambit other sacred spaces. True art breaks boundaries and Mathura sandstone did just that. Its specimens have been found as far away as Takshila, clearly showing that all three strains, Hindu, Buddhist and Jain, were flourishing here. Upstream of the Ganga in the Himalayas lies Rishikesh, a small pilgrim town where the sacred river descends from the Himalayas to enter the plains of India. For centuries, pilgrims and seekers have flocked to this landscape, seeking escape from worldly matters. The presence of Mother Ganga, washing away sins of humanity, steadfast in its resolve to serve, lends this space a spiritual energy rarely felt anywhere else. I have come to Rishikesh looking for the town's Mathura connection especially in respect of ancient sandstone artifacts found here. In Rishikesh lies the somewhat obscure temple named Bharat Mandir, an ancient pilgrimage site close to the Ganga, where sandstone sculptures of great historical value, depicting the art of Mathura, have been found in excavations near the river bank. The temple finds mention in the Kedar Khand of the Skanda Purana. It is believed that Lord Vishnu pleased immensely with the penance of the great sage Raibhya at this holy site, granted him a boon that he would reside here forever in this temple as Rishikesh Narayan. Since then, in the Kali Yuga, Lord Vishnu is worshipped in this shrine as Bharat. On the banks of Ganga in Rishikesh, this beautiful stone structural temple where we can see this image of a dancing Ganesha. Very fluid movement of Ganesha can be observed. And we have all these floral patterns and amidst the floral patterns we have the beautiful series of lions. 
where we can see a series of lines as if they are about to pounce onto something. And then this beautiful figure of uh, some goddess uh, with all the embellishments and jewelry uh, riding an elephant. The temple itself is a very interesting mix of uh, the traditional stone sculptures and then topped up with lime surki plaster with a lot of wall painting embellishments. Of course, the old structure is still intact and then a mandapam has been added to the old temple and each sculpture speaks out to you. At this point, there must have stood a sculpture of Lord Shiva. We can still see the imprint of the sculpture. There is a door frame with floral petals and on the two sides of the frame, there must have been images of Ganga and Yamuna. And you can see, still see a faint image of the Ganga figure or the river figure standing atop the lotus. Um, the entire sculpture lends itself a lot of peace, a lot of uh, strong imagery of what this temple must have been at one point in time. Another fantastic depiction of Yamaraj. It's, it's a very rare find in art that you can see a figure of Yamaraj riding probably a bull or a, uh, or a buffalo and then the horns in the headgear with, with Yamaraj himself holding a lakula in his hand. And again, the door frame, the beautiful door frame with floral features and the depiction of the two rivers lends this temple a very interesting aspect. If you look at the whole temple, you can see that it's a stone structural temple. The base of the temple is built out of stone. Over the years, lime surki plaster has been added with wall paintings, giving it a completely new dimension. The wall paintings have, of course, faded, revealing the beautiful stone sculptures uh, that would have otherwise been hidden behind the temple plaster. Pink sandstone is not usually found in these hills. Then why would one find sculptures of spotted pink sandstone here? And yet, in the past four decades, informal excavations in the area have yielded some exciting finds in sandstone. One of them is the life-sized sculpture, a 1.5 meter high male figure, perhaps one of the earliest figural representations of Shiva. The figure clearly depicts Shiva on a pedestal, his feet apart, one arm granting blessings, with the other holding a garment. Perhaps even more interesting and a little more well-preserved is the female figure excavated alongside the Shiva sculpture. This figure standing upright depicts her also holding a garment with one hand while the other arm, now lost to time, seems to be hanging down. The striking figure is comparable to the more well-known sculpture of the much celebrated Didar Ganj Yakshi found just outside Patliputra. The Didarganj Yakshi is, of course, one of the finest examples of very early Indian stone statues. It is usually dated between 1st and 2nd century CE. The sculpture is now in the Bihar Museum in Patna, close to where it was found in 1917. Patna, as Patliputra, was of course the Mauryan capital in ancient India. The Didarganj Yakshi holds the fly whisk, 
or chauri in the right hand, whereas the left hand is again lost to time. The pink sandstone figure at the Bharat Mandir in Rishikesh was sculpted only a century after the chauri bearing Didar Ganjiyakshi. If we look closely, the female figure at Rishikesh has a great resemblance to the Didar Ganj figure. A large circular face with almond-shaped eyes, a nose with a sunken bridge and of course the delicate smile. Simple necklaces adorn the otherwise bare upper body. Girdles composed of strands of beads hold the hip-hugging lower garments in place. The figure, doubtless, represents a feminine nature spirit or Yakshi. Despite the resemblance, the figure from Rishikesh does not seem to be carrying a whisk. Its arm is held down, though broken, and the object held though severely abraded resembles a kamandalu, a begging pot carried by ascetics. Such a pot is usually carried by Parvati, the daughter of the snowy mountains, princess who chose to accompany the Adi Yogi, the ascetic Shiva. In keeping with custom, the female figure has been kept 1.25 meters high, perceptibly shorter than her male counterparts. However, the general sculpting, ornamentation and dress clearly indicates that the two figures are a couple, also pointing towards a representation of Shiva's eternal consort, Parvati. This makes the two idols the earliest surviving paired image of Shiva and Parvati, a subject of art that gained popularity only from the 4th century onward. The journey of these sculptures from the sandstone sculpting regions can only be imagined. However, the presence of these sculptures in Rishikesh on the banks of the Ganga clearly points towards the establishment of a strong connection during the period between the 1st and the 4th centuries between the Himalayas, Ganga and Shiva and also Mathura and Rishikesh. Truly, the presence of these life-sized, largely unknown sculptures found along the Ganga and their uncharted journey from the workshops of Mathura to Rishikesh forces one to think of the great interconnections of spiritual art in ancient India. Meanwhile, the journey to discover the poetry in stone continues unabated.